as I'm thinking about what I want to say to you guys over the last couple of weeks, just t- trying to prepare, for some reason, the word hope kept coming to my mind. And I don't know why. I'm not going to preach, even though I'm standing in the pulpit. I'm going to resist <laughs> the urge to do that. But the word hope is one of those words. It can be a noun. It can be a verb. It can be an adjective. I'm sure it can be some other parts of speech, Mr. Tanner, um, at different times. But it's one of those words um, that can be dangerous, but also can be exciting. And um, leaning us towards the future. And so I find myself saying the word hope a lot. I'll write an email. Hope you have a good day. Hope you have a good week. I hope the Braves get a win today in their season opener. Um, I hope my son has a good birthday. Today is our son's birthday. And so everyone is always like, oh my gosh, I can't believe his birthday is on April Fool's Day. Nobody wants their child to be born on April Fool's Day. Well, I'll tell you who wants their child to be born on April Fool's Day. It's a woman who's nine months and two days pregnant. (laughs) She is completely fine having a child on April Fool's Day. And so, you know, we say hope all the time. And I'm reminded a couple of years ago, you may have seen this photo when Notre Dame caught on fire in Paris. There was this image, and it looked like a black and white photo because the sky was gray, and around it in the image were all these charred remains of that beautiful structure. Still standing in those charred remains was a cross. And some of you may have seen that. For some of you, that may mean nothing. For some of you, it may mean everything. But for me, what it stands for is hope and what we're going to do next, what's coming next. And I think Dr. Newcomb alluded to that. What, what is coming next for all of us? People who study generational diversity, this is something I find really interesting. They say that there are crystallizing events in every generation that really impact that generation, that change a generation. So for some folks, that's going to be the invasion of Pearl Harbor. The next event was the assassination of John F. Kennedy. The next event, which is my generation, and I'm totally dating myself, but I was very young when this happened, was the Challenger exploding. The next event was 9-11. And so if you were alive during any of those events, right now you could tell me where you were or what you were doing when those things happened. And so I think for today's generation, it's the whole year of 2020. It's not just one event. It's the social and the political unrest. And of course, it's the pandemic and how that's affected us. So as we talk about hope, there's some things that I want to make sure that you leave here. And I hope that you leave here thinking some new things about CTC. I know many of you know that we do a variety of things. We do adult education, and we help students here in Paulding at our Paulding campus earn their GED. We do corporate training. We train a lot of students who come to us to fill that role of the community college. So many students are coming to CTC to take their core classes before transferring to a four-year university. And so, in addition to what Dr. Newcomb says, I hope you'll leave here today thinking about someone in your life who could benefit from the things that we offer at CTC, but especially from that technical training. Um, I'll show that photo real quick of our campus. Many of you are aware of this. I hope you know where our campus is at um, Nathan Dean and 278. Inside those buildings, you're going to find classrooms, you're going to find labs, you're going to find learning spaces, libraries, all those things that you would normally imagine. At the bottom of this, you're going to see where we are enrollment-wise with people from Paulding County. So not everyone from Paulding goes to the Paulding campus, obviously. Many of our programs are at specific locations. So this spring, we have 1,042 Paulding County residents. And I'm always curious, is it like Paulding residents or Pauldinians or Paulding Countyans? I need someone to explain. We need to decide on that. Um, But that's how many students are attending CTC. And that's 12% of our enrollment. Now, if you're doing math really quickly in your head, which I would not be, but if you are, um, you're you're seeing where those numbers lead us. And I'm going to tell you something that Dr. Newcomb obviously doesn't want us to tell everybody, and we don't say it a lot, and that is that the pandemic has caused us to have lower enrollment, quite simply. Everyone always, when I see all of your sweet faces in the community, people always say, oh, how's the college, how's enrollment? And if I'm being honest, I have to say it's down a little bit this this year. And that is a direct impact of the pandemic. And this next slide shows you, if you were to go and research what impact the pandemic has had on community colleges, these are the types, the titles of the kinds of articles that you would see. Now, I'm going to talk in stereotypes for a minute, which I don't normally like to do because our students are very diverse. Our students are every age, every color, every background. Um, all over the board, every socioeconomic class. 
but many of our students are in their mid-20s, so many of them have what I call some responsibilities. They may not have a full-fledged family and a mortgage, but they may have a car payment. They may have an apartment. And many of them work jobs that are in industries like hospitality or retail. And so we all know that those industries have been hit really hard. And so when people have to make decisions sometimes between paying bills and, in, and taking their college classes, sometimes those paying bills decisions have to come first. Many of our students are parents. And with the unrest and unknown about what was going to happen with school, they've had to make the decision that all parents would to put their children first. Maybe they wait to return to college or stop taking classes so that they can be there to homeschool their children or to work with them when they're quarantined or whatever the case may be. So it has been extremely difficult for our student body. We are working to help them and find new ways to serve them in different ways. Um, we're gonna talk, I'm gonna talk to you now about, you can go ahead and teach it. Um, kind of our new normal. Dr. Newcomb said that, and I had some folks, some friends, who are like, oh, I just hate that, that, that phrase, the new normal. I want it to go back to the way it was. It's not going to go back to the way it was. Just like those crystallizing events that I spoke about earlier, things don't, they don't go back. But we have an opportunity to be better on the other side of this. What can we do to better serve our students? What can you do to better serve your customers or to better serve your employees? Those are things we want to look for. Is what can we take from this terrible situation? How can we grow from it? These photos are fun photos. The top photo is a campus event where you can see everyone's masked up because we have been wearing masks on campus since we returned. Um, and so that's a new normal for us. And we anticipate some loosening of that eventually, but that's our norm right now. This bottom photo, we did not have commencement exercises at the college as many of you high school students were not able to either. That was a really hard decision for me because for some of our students, that's the first opportunity they've ever had to walk across the stage and be formally recognized for an educational achievement. So we made the decision that we couldn't have it in person, but we decided to have a drive-through graduation celebration. So this event was on the coldest day of 2020. There were even snowflakes that day. Um, it was very cold, but our students literally drove up with their family and friends in a car, hopped out, walked down a red carpet, had their photo made with Dr. Newcomb and their award, and they were able to celebrate some little semblance of what they normally would. So we're just, again, trying to find those new ways to serve students. Dr. Newcomb mentioned this earlier, <clears throat> and one of the challenges that we saw when we transitioned, so you kind of understand the timetable for us. In March last year, when we made the decision, like everyone else, that we, you know, we, we were in unprecedented times. And so while we closed our doors for a short period of time, we did not close our operations. We basically, in about 48 hours, had to shift everything that we were doing in person online. So all of our classes had to be pushed online. All of our services to students had to be pushed online. And for some students, that was okay. For some of our students, it's been a little more difficult. Um, I talk at New Student Orientation a lot, and when I talk to parents and students, I warn them about online classes. Because, I don't know if you guys have ever seen this, but if you're ever homesick, or have a sick child, for a while there, there were two types of commercials. Personal injury lawyers and people going to college in their pajamas, as if going to college were something you do part-time or just, you know, in your spare time. And so people who come to me and say, oh, I just want to take all online classes. I don't have time for college. I'm, I'm taking it back a little bit. I said, well, let me explain to you how much harder an online class is than an in-person class. And I see some heads nodding because some of you have probably taken some online classes. You have to be a self-starter, you have to be motivated, you cannot procrastinate, you have to follow directions, and sometimes, not only are you the student, you're someone the teacher too. And while we work for ways to improve how we deliver online education, for some of our students, that methodology is very difficult for them. And we had students, quite honestly, that didn't have Wi-Fi at home. They depended on our libraries, or the public library, or Chick-fil-A's, um, lobby for Wi-Fi or they didn't have a laptop and so we've shifted some of that we offered in the summer we had to go back to having some classes in person because as you can imagine it's very hard to train a welder online it's very hard to change to train an automotive technician online we have to see that students are able to perform certain skills and so we've slowly made the migration back but we still have a lot of our classes online 
And that may or may not be difficult for some of our students. Some of the things that are still going really well for us, um, our welding program, you guys know, when we open the doors here in the Paulding campus, it's been full since we opened it. We can always take more. We will always um, take more. But they had higher enrollment this fall than they did last fall, which is amazing. Um, they're graduating students. And I don't know how many of you know Jim Thomas. And don't tell him I said this. But you know the saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks? Well, that's what we've done this last year. We've had to teach people who were welders by trade how to teach online. So not only are they taking that step from being a welder but to an educator, but now they're an online educator. And so all of our programs have pivoted that way and now have a lot of online components, which are great things for our students. It's gonna allow us to be able to take more students. It's going to allow us to, for students to be able to work more while they're enrolled in college. So there's gonna be a lot of benefits from them. The next program that I'm going to highlight that um, I have to is the Associate of Science and Nursing. If you've ever heard me talk before, you're probably tired of hearing me do it, but when they stop being fabulous, I'll stop talking about it. And they are not stop, they're not going to stop. So a couple things, we have an Associate of Science in Nursing. So just for information's sake, when you earn an Associate of Science in Nursing, you take the NCLEX, which is the national test to become a registered nurse, to become an RN. So there are two levels of RNs most of the time, bachelor's degree earners and associate degree learners, okay? They all take the same registry test. So nationally, when students sit for this test, folks who earn an associate degree, nationally the pass rate is about 82, 83, 84%. For a bachelor's degree, where they've had two more years of training, that pass rate is closer to 88, 89, which makes sense, they've had two more years of training, right? Well, I'm proud to report to you that in the middle of a pandemic, we graduated our December class of nursing students and every single student has passed the NCLEX. That, it, it's amazing. It really is amazing. Our program is fantastic. And they all, of course, went to work. And in a year when I think we've probably valued nurses more than ever in my lifetime, I'm thinking that they had some pretty great choices of places to go. I know we've had a hard time keeping our faculty because the hospitals are begging them to come to work and going to pay them handsomely to do that at this point in time. We had over 400 applicants for the cohort, so the program remains in high demand. An applicant is not just someone who stops their car, comes into one of our admissions offices and says, I think I want to be a nurse. An applicant is a student who's already spent a whole year taking prerequisite courses, so they're that devoted. So we're having 400 students just for that. So they're that devoted to the, to the program. We're getting ready to do some remodeling at the Paulding campus to add a simulation center. We already have some small space for that, but some more simulation space for students so they're not just practicing on each other. And so that if there is ever another time when we cannot get into clinicals, that we have some space for students to do that. We're also going to be opening another Associate of Science in Nursing program at our Appalachian campus in Jasper. So this will give the opportunity for even more students to become registered nurses when they leave us. One thing that I forgot to say this about welding, but I'm gonna say it about nursing too, is interestingly enough, remember how I said that not all people from Paulding come to the Paulding campus? It's very interesting to me to know how many people come from outside of our county to attend our college. So I checked the rosters, both nursing and welding. Welding has students from 13 different counties coming to Paulding. 13 different counties coming to our campus. And nursing has 12. So people from all over our service area and all of our community in the metro area are traveling to Paulding for education. That should be important to us for economic development reasons alone. Um, go ahead and let's get, talk about the next thing. Very exciting, we have been talking about the Aviation Training Academy and celebrating that for a while. It continues to move forward. We're excited about this at the Paulding Northwest Atlanta Airport. It's gonna be a 60,000 square foot space. It's gonna be a big space. Um, one of the things that I wanna put out to you guys while you're here is when I'm in the community, people ask me about it. For some reason, people have misconceptions about what it's gonna be and I always get asked if we're training pilots. And I'm like, no, that's not what we're doing. We're training maintenance technicians. And so what we call things are important and we wanna make sure that we put that information out there. Um, 
you'll see that there's an associate of science degree that the AAS and then the diploma and then the TCC stands for a technical certificate of credit those are quicker forms of training so that someone could get into the world of work in a year or less in most situations so it's not this huge time investment in their education so we're very excited and that project continues to work forward so I've talked to you a lot about hope so now I want to talk to you about the vision Hops. So we are going to be um, in a couple in the year. We're very excited. We're going to have Georgia's first brewing and fermentation technology program. So this is very exciting for us as a college. Again, it's going to be the first program like it in Georgia. Um, if you don't know anything about that industry, in 2019 there were 29 craft beer establishments in the state of Georgia. There were some legislative changes that happened. And in 2020, there were 136. This year, there are 21 additional that are set to open. It's a $30 million, $30 million industry. And Paulding's first brewery just opened a couple of weeks ago here within our own county. So funny thing about this is that last week, our marketing department did a social media blast about this and I reshared it and said, oh, exciting things happening at CTC. And I had so many friends who volunteered as taste testers so many friends who are willing to step up to that challenge and while i appreciate so much their support of the college um, we're going to be looking for students for that program for sure and so we're excited about that the next slide that i want to tell you about that brewing program is going to be at our north metro campus and i focus on north metro's campus while i'm talking to folks from Paulding because if you live in the northern part of the county like i do it's almost as close to drive to the at Worth North Metro campus as it is to our Paulding campus. Our Center for Advanced Manufacturing, and this is that area where we definitely need students. We're opening a new building there with state-of-the-art robot robotics lab. So for students who are doing industrial maintenance, precision machining, those programs that we have people begging us for graduates. And here's the thing about that. We talk about this all the time. If they're having a hard time finding a graduate, unfortunately, I'm probably having finding a hard time finding a student. And so we all have to work together, as Dr. Newcomb was saying, to get all kinds of students interested in those programs. The next, um, yeah, so this is something that's really near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm the daughter of a disabled veteran, and so veterans causes are very important to me and this is going to be at our Marietta campus so the Vector Center which is Veterans Education Career Transition Resource you see why we're calling it Vector um, Center so we're repurposing some space at our Marietta campus I'm doing some remodeling for the center for our veteran students we're going to be expanding some recreation space that we have for veterans but also putting them in very close proximity to some of our resources that we have for all of our students. And so we are thrilled about this and, and very, very excited. The most exciting thing and the most hopeful thing that I could ever do when I talk about Chattahoochee is to tell stories of our students. Like Dr. Newcomb says, I tend to get emotional about it. I always tell myself I'm not going to, but when I'm standing up here thinking about their lives changing because of education, I always get emotional. I am not gonna do that today. So what I'm going to do is show you um, Samantha's picture. Every year, the college has the Georgia Occupational Award of Leadership competition. And basically that's our student of the year competition. So students are nominated from every program. They come in, with their, accept their nomination, they do a panel interview, and then they do a presentation about how technical education has impacted their life. And then we narrow it down to four. I'm very happy to tell you that two out of the four were Paulding residents this year, which I think is fantastic. This is Samantha Vernon. She, um, her story is really unique, not, not unique to us, but maybe to some folks. She enrolled at a four-year institution. She wanted to be a nurse. She got discouraged with her class size, with her inability to get the prerequisite courses that she needed. And she somewhat reluctantly gave Chattahoochee Tech a look. So now she is in our practical nursing program. So when she leaves, she'll be an LPN when she passes her licensure exam and she will go to work. Now she, of course, is very interested in becoming an RN. So her plans are to finish our LPN and then to do our bridge program, LPN to RN. And we've had a lot of successful students do that. So she's very excited about getting in the field sooner. I think one thing that this pandemic has done 
has made people who feel that calling to work in healthcare, it's made it more clear to them and maybe more pressed. And so she's excited to be able to get them to work faster. And then excitingly enough, the winner this year is also a Paulding County resident. This is Dustin Ferguson. Dustin is in our Associate of Science in Nursing program. So not only is Dustin a Paulding resident, but he attends our Paulding campus and he is our student of the year. So in closing, I just wanna say that I hope each of you maybe heard or learned something new about CTC and I hope you all have a great Easter.